Soul Calibur is the sequel to Namco's Soul Edge, and it was released as a launch title for the Sega Dreamcast. It was also one of the first games to show off the Dreamcast. SUPERIOR GRAPHICAL TECHNOLOGY! And it also happens to be an amazingly awesome fighting game. The story of Soul Calibur is that WHO CARES IT'S A FIGHTING GAME JUST BEAT THE CRAP OUT OF THE PERSON IN FRONT OF YOU AND DON'T ASK WHY! As I mentioned earlier, the graphics are pretty good for their time. In fact, this is one of the few games that ended up looking better on home consoles than it did in the arcade. Unfortunately, you won't see the graphics as good as they could be because I do not have a Dreamcast VGA cord or a way to capture from one. And the sound in this game is amazingly awesome, with a capital amazing. Basically, it's just some really epic, like, orchestral stuff and whatnot. My favorite track would probably be Nightmare's Theme, or In the Name of Father as it's called, and I actually have it on my phone. Speaking of sound, I can't talk about Soul Calibur without mentioning the amazingly overdramatic narrator. Fun fact, his voice actor is actually Jeff Manning, the announcer in the original Super Smash Bros. The gameplay is pretty on point, let me explain to you how it works. So you have four buttons. One of them represents a horizontal slash, one a vertical slash, one a kick, and then you have a button to block. If you press all of the attack buttons together at once, you do a soul charge, which makes your moves more powerful for a short time, but leaves you open to attack. The gameplay is similar to Tekken in that it's pretty simple, even casual players can enjoy it, but if you want to get really deep into it and learn all the moves and combos and all that, then you'll definitely get a lot out of the game. Also like in Tekken, there's a juggling system where you can hit enemies while they're airborne to keep them in the air and extend combos, but the other player can control themselves in the air and try to steer themselves away from your attacks, similar to how DI works in Smash Brothers. Like in Virtua Fighter, characters can be knocked out of the ring, or in the case of this Yoshimitsu, be idiots and throw themselves out. Though it does raise the question, how do they get on these platforms? How do they get off? It's the 1500s, it's not like they could call a helicopter to airlift them out or anything. You know, Namco, this game you made about a magical sword that eats people's souls and stuff, you know, it just doesn't make any sense. The game happens to come with a variety of modes. There's your usual versus mode and an arcade mode like you'd find in pretty much any fighting game that's not named Street Fighter V. The time attack mode is kind of like the one in Tekken in that no one ever plays it. There's also a survival mode and an extra survival mode, where the characters will die in one hit. This is a great mode to pick if you enjoyed getting 50 characters into survival mode thinking that you're going to set a new record when all of a sudden one stray hit ends your game. You'll spend most of your single player time in mission mode, where you do missions, obviously, with special conditions such as being unable to sidestep or having to defeat this many opponents in a row. And this is the way that you'll primarily earn points, which can be exchanged for artwork, costumes, and weapon demonstrations. And now it's time to go over each character one by one. Baldo is a blind mute guy that wields katars, and, uh, you know, this guy gave me nightmares as a kid, so I think I'm just gonna move on to the next one now if you don't mind. And now we move on to Ivy. So Ivy's got, like, a sword or something that can turn into a whip, and she's a very difficult character to use effectively, but if you know how to use her, then you're guaranteed to pretty much trounce everyone else, and in that case, she becomes an absolute pain in the butt to fight. So Sophitia has a short sword and a shield, and if you pay attention to her backstory, you'll see that it actually involves the Greek pantheon, so does that mean this game is canon to Percy Jackson? Mitsuruki is your typical katana-using samurai guy, and he's the only character to be playable in every Soul game, which means that I guess he's popular, but, you know, I don't really care about him that much. You can tell Killick is a complete idiot because he decided to bring a stick to a sword fight, but I used him a lot as a kid because I would just stay at the other side of the screen and just slap people around with my really long stick, so, I don't know, I guess he's not all bad. Killick's future baby mama is, I guess, sort of a main character because she wields Soul Calibur and all that, but, you know, as I said, no one cares about the storyline, so whatever. She would become really annoying in Soul Calibur 2, but thankfully in this game her voice is somewhere near tolerable. This nunchuck wielder is supposed to be a pirate, yes, a pirate, but really he just looks like an Elvis impersonator. You know, like there were in the 1500s. You know, aside from being incredibly anachronistic, 
He is a good no-skill character because you can just button mash your way to victory. And here we have it, folks. The best character in this whole game, my personal main in every Soul Calibur game. He's an evil knight, and he wields a giant living sword that eats people's souls. Tell me, how is that not the most amazing fighting game character ever? Taki in this game represents the obligatory ninja that every fighting game must have. However, this one actually makes sense because it's not a ninja just walking around in the modern day like in, say, Virtua Fighter. But anyways, she fights with two Kodachi, which is about twice as many as she used in the original game. And she also moves super fast, which makes her a giant pain in the butt to fight because you can't hit her! Astroth is a giant homunculus that carries a gigantic axe the size of Alaska and hits you like a dump truck to the face. But thankfully he's slower than molasses flavored escargot, so you can dodge him and you'll have nothing to worry about. And now it's time for the unlockable characters. Huang is a veteran from Soul Edge and the first unlockable character. Unfortunately, he did not stick around because in the second Soul Calibur, he was replaced by this annoying, whiny kid named Young Sung. Yoshimitsu is the ancestor of the Tekken character, also called Yoshimitsu, and he has a lot of the same moves. But unfortunately, the Sword Poco isn't quite as effective in this game as it is in Tekken. Did you like playing as Reptile in Mortal Kombat, but didn't think he looked enough like a disgusting lizard? Well, here's the character for you. But unfortunately, he can't spit acid or anything like that, because he's just a clone of Sophia. Before Soul Edge corrupted his soul, Nightmare was a good little boy named Siegfried, who looked a bit too much like Cloud Strike. Obviously, you know, what with the giant sword and all, he's a clone of Nightmare. Returning from Soul Edge, Rock is kind of like Astroth in that he carries around a gigantic battle axe. You can also tell he's really cool because he cuts off a bison's head and wears it to battle. Sung Mina, who returns from Soul Edge, is kind of like Killick if he was just smart enough to put a blade at the end of his stick. She also has the best move in the game, and it's called Opening Treasure. I think you can see why. Ivy's dad is demoted from being a boss in Soul Edge to just another secret unlockable character in Soul Calibur. He also happens to be a demonic zombie pirate, and those are three words that go awesomely together. Edge Master is a mimic character, just like Mokujin in Tekken. Basically, for each round, he'll copy a random moveset from another fighter, and then switch upon the next round. Inferno is the final boss of Soul Calibur, and he can eventually be unlocked so you can play as him, but unfortunately his playable form looks more like a mound of jello instead of the flaming skeleton that the boss version is. But unfortunately he's also just another edge master because apparently one wasn't lazy enough. And there you have it folks, all 19 characters summarized. Seriously though, if you haven't played this game yet, do yourself a favor, go out and get it. Not only is it the fourth best fighting game of all time in terms of review scores, and hey, when are those ever untrustworthy, but it's also really not that expensive to get. This game is an absolute must-have for any fighting game player or Dreamcast fan. And that was my first video game review. Um, I hope it wasn't too terrible. Hopefully not. Um, so anyways, yeah, I'll be making more of these in the future, but man, this took me a while. This was a learning experience, I tell you. But anyways, um, hopefully I'll get better with time. I probably will. Um, anyways, if you want to check out more of me, then go to the Console Warriors channel, which you can get to by clicking the screen. Uh, it's a Let's Play channel, and it's not just me, it's other people, but honestly, I'm the reason you, you would go to Console Warriors. Everyone knows that. I am the best. But anyways, this is Mike Roch Plays Games, signing out.